Hello and welcome to Royale Without Cheese, our bi-weekly podcast in which we discuss both the classic and the unknown of art and popular cinema from the then and now. We are your hosts, Meet, Mash Ferreira, and Leonard Miranda. Hello there. Hey, hey. Our third companion, Miguel, is away at the festival for the moment. This is our talk show segment where we welcome grand filmmakers to our wonderful couch and discuss their work. Here with us we have Luis Fernando Puente, a Mexican director originally from Monterrey and now based in Utah. Luis studied media arts at Brigham Young University, where he developed his voice as a filmmaker. Amongst his short film work, we'll discuss I Have No Tears and I Must Cry, nominated for Best Short Film at the 2023 Sundance Film Festival. The film follows Maria Luisa, played by Alejandra Herrera, an immigrant struggling to legalize her stay in the US when her green card interview takes a critical turn. We'll also discuss his previous short, El Muño, winner of the Golden Gate Award at the San Francisco International Film Festival. So, Luis, how are we feeling today? Ah, feeling great, feeling great. Right? Did I do justice to your description, <laughs> to your biography? <laughs> right like, I, I always forget, like, who do I, who do I send my description, my biography, and all these things to? And, and I, you know, just, I'm like, well, it's getting there, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, rock solid. Uh, well, first of all, we must say congratulations on being at, at Sundance or on your festival with uh, I Have No Tears and I Must Cry. Uh, it received great acclaim at Sundance, but also at Nashville Film Festival and Guanajuato International Film Festival. We particularly find it uh, very interesting in its visual atmosphere because your use of long lenses and these tight close-ups really envelop the worried faces you have in your film of Maria and her husband in this kind of bleak atmosphere. And uh, it's all within this office that in its geography really has this claustrophobic emerald blue sense. So we really want to know from you, uh, what were some of the artists and filmmakers that inspire you or influenced you during your storyboard and the mood board process? Yeah, very, very much so. Um, so Oscar Jimenez, my cinematographer and I, we, we collaborate a lot. In in very very early on, whenever we start a project, we just start looking, picking frames, grabbing. You know, a shot deck is great for <laughs> that kind of stuff. It is, it is. Um, I use it as well. Yeah. So in our mood board, we had a lot of uh, we had a lot of Bergman, and we had a we had a lot of shots from specifically from um, even previous uh, films, uh, The Passion of Joan of Arc, especially like the close ups and stuff like that that we had. We, a lot of that we wanted to derive, even from there, it's where we kind of wanted to look at reflections and looking through glass, um, because there's a lot of reflective shots, very expressive shots in that film itself. That we thought, like, oh, I think we could do something with this, that we built it as well into our, our language of the film. And so quickly there, we, we started realizing as well the, the aspect ratio of 4-3, um, when it when it comes to uh, framing those those close ups, those very very um, almost like straightforward close ups, um, they were just a lot more intimate and a lot more um, claustrophobic in in both ways. To that we wanted to say like, okay, well we'll just keep this aspect ratio here because we were thinking about a few aspect ratios, and then for three we're just like yeah, this this feels right for for this film. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I would like to know as well Leo's opinion, but I thought it was one of the most effective uses of 4 by 3 that I've seen. A lot of festival films tend to use that aspect ratio, I think. And sometimes I wonder if it falls on the on the area of it's interesting to use because it is artsy. But in your film, <laughs> it had a very interesting application. And uh, yeah, it's very interesting picks there with Bergman. And uh, I'm very impressed. Bergman and uh, what was the other one? John the Park, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dryer. That's well, fun. we that's dryer, really yeah. Well, we were also looking at, for example, Ida. Um, I know that's always kind of like a yeah. first to go to, just because we love the cinematographer that with. Um, and we, it's almost kind of always like a starting point, and then seeing like, okay, where did they build off from, and yeah, and to bring some of that. Um, I mean that that film itself. I think one of the things you mentioned, it's like, oh, it's the artsy kind of like aspect <laughs> ratio, but that film itself as well. Uh, uses it so well to um, play with headroom, and and I'm and I love when when filmmakers just take risks and and play yeah. with headroom. It's something that I've wanted to do. Um, I wanted to do originally for the film, but it just I didn't really have much much of the. I think I only had a kind of headroom shot like that for only one shot kind of thing, and and it was a wider wider one. But um, 
other than that, yeah, just the the way it's like, well, let's try to fill up the frame. You know, we have yeah, we have so much up and down. Let's see what we can do with this. Definitely, I think I remember specifically what shot you're talking about. If I'm thinking of it uh, right, it's a wide one, but it's not just that you have great headspace or headroom above them. It's also okay. the fact, hi, cat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's also the fact, uh, two cat owners here. Uh, mm -hmm. It's also the fact that um, you're framing the characters at one of the edges of the frame, mm -hmm. I think. You're also yeah, leaving yeah, a lot yeah. of room in one of yeah. the thirds. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a strange position. And they're left alone in the room after like the bureaucratic clerk leaves yeah. them. Yeah. And I thought uh, it was very poignant to just use it once right there. And then I thought it was very interesting. I mean, the the, the editing process was 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 quite great. I, I tend to not want to overshoot scenes in general, but when I do want a scene to have punch, I, I do like to just try a lot of angles, especially if I know, I mean, then this is now my thing, because I used to 80 uh, projects when I was used to be like a student and, and, and you know, and, and I've talked with a lot of ADs. I have, I have the sensitivity to be like when I'm writing, even when I'm uh -huh. writing, I'm thinking like, hmm, <laughs> how am I going to shoot this with like one or two? And then this is like, okay, if I do that with this scene, then with this scene, I can definitely get like eight shots of, of yeah. And I can definitely play with that. But anyways, going back to that, uh yeah, I, I think I think that scene specifically we had, I mean we were that was all we we're shooting that day. So Oscar and I were just like, yeah, let's let's play around with these angles. And there were a few few of those shots that made it in the in the cut that we thought um that were actually very improvised as well. Um so it was it was a fun it was a fun shoot. So that's interesting. You like to have a mix both of preparation, 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 but had room for um improvisation on the day yeah well i like to go into a scene thinking about the cut like in my in my head already and so before i before i i i, I go into another angle of coverage i do like to think okay what other thing or how is this going to cut with what we just shot per se or how is this going to cut with another shot that i know i'm going to grab and such that way I feel like in the editing room, it doesn't feel as much of a surprise. And I think that we did that for a few of the uh, just inserts and everything that I think we were able to just kind of put in places anywhere. And I think we shot them in a way that uh, they weren't jarring or, or, you know, it just, they just felt really well. We like, oh, now we can use this insert here because it, it, it helps with the, you know. Yeah, it, definitely so yeah and while doing the mood board this is one question that i've always kind of come across you know you're doing it and of course from project to project you have constant inspirations that serve as your guiding lights but for me the question is really when you're trying to find new references new mm -hmm. inspirations where do you look for because sometimes you're trying to find what's this new music i'm hearing what's this new image i'm looking for and you surf the web and there's so much information sometimes one, per yeah. one person can like be lost where to find things I actually look at short films that have been playing okay. in the in the recent festival in the in the recent festival uh, run. My 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 big mentor Robert Machoan uh, loves to just. I mean, he he. Uh, we we both live here in Utah, and he you know, we always manage to get like passes to go to Sundance and such like that. But he always tries to at least get one or two uh, screenings to the shorts. Um, just the shorts category, because that is where it's either that or 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 categories like the next category at Sundance, um, which is the more uh, kind of groundbreaking. What what people are doing, you know, what is new, what is what is that fresh sensitivity? And I feel short film specifically because they're 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 independent. You know, I I I I feel like I've only seen maybe one or two short films that are actually produced by big by big productions. And in that independent spirit, there's a lot more uh, freedom, I think, for directors to just be uh, kind of unhinged. You know, in mm -hmm. in, in in expression and and cinema. And so, I feel like that's where the most uh, unique ideas uh, come from. And yeah. especially even thinking now, I mean, uh, now that I'm making I Have No Tears, uh, the, the feature version that I'm writing out, um, it's it's interesting to think how just a different of approach, even visually, that I'm, I'm thinking about it just because it's not a short, you know, it's like I think the ideas I have compacted in, in 12, 13 minutes 
you know, I'm gonna have to like expand visually through um, through like a full length feature film. And so I think I think shorts are just these nuggets of of brilliant things that that people are doing. And so even for my next projects, I am already looking. For example, of when you left me on on, on when you left me on that boulevard um, that won the the grand jury. Um, just looking at that film for inspiration for my next things, and I'm looking for some of the other films that that I and other filmmakers that I've already met in the in this festival circuit, um, using them to think like, oh, okay, this is interesting how they did this and that. I wonder how that applies into my, I, how I could use that in my in my new project with some of the other ideas that I've already kind of grown with. Continuing it with, I have no tears, yeah. obviously. Uh, we know that the idea came from your own experience with the immigration process, more specifically your wife's real life green card interview. So, and obviously this, no, uh, this knowledge is very palpable in the, in the emotion of the, the actors and um, how they carry the, the, the sparse dialogue moments and how natural it all feels. So if we may ask if it's not too much intruding, uh, how much of that personal experience ended on the paper? And now that you mentioned also the, the putting it into a feature, um, mm. what's that process like? Not just maybe relieving it and reprocessing those emotions, but uh, also like, how do you employ a, a more critical, like, okay, what tools am I going to employ to, to put this here? Yeah. Um, a lot of, I would say like a hundred percent of all the emotions <laughs> that were felt in real life and everything. Uh, were put into the short, uh, but but it's also another. I think one of the the biggest exercises that I had to employ was also to try to look at the situation that even we lived um, from a very objective point. Because um, in cinema, you don't want to. I mean, you you do you do have you know subjectivity in in the stories that you're telling. But you, I feel like the best ones also try to be very, as objective as possible, uh, with with re, with regards to characters, with where they're coming from, and everything, because people, I think people know when they feel like they're being preached at. I think, um, and and sometimes even when you want to make a point of something, uh, you also want to give them the space to to process it. And so, for us, the biggest kind of person that we were trying to think about that was actually the immigration officer. Um, and the immigration officer, when we when we approached that character, we thought it's like, yeah, this person was was kind of if he felt like a jerk when we were when we were there present. But then we also started to think about, OK, well, what, you know, you don't just wake up and say, I'm like, I'm going to ruin some immigrants lives today. You know, there's there's got to be processes that go to that. And, and we just started making scenarios and such. I actually work very closely with um, the immigration world uh, here in, in, in Utah and Salt Lake. And I know that the, that the immigration officer that we had, whom the immigration officer um, is based on, actually, I think some of his family also works in immigration. And in real life, the immigration officer was an immigrant themselves. So it, it, so we, we just started kind of looking at those contexts and and giving that to our our talent in order to, uh, you know, clearly make our our you know that USCIS officer an antagonist, uh, but not a villain. And so I think that's the that's the kind of uh, work that I am doing, and that that's the idea that I want to put again towards the feature film. The feature film obviously varies from our our own like lived experiences immigrants in the sense of how things went right after another but they do bring in the uh encapsulating the anxiety and the and the and the pressures of being an immigrant in the US and trying to make uh that work and so not only is it the US immigration system it's also very much the um the, just this pressure of being all very, very successful in a hyper-capitalistic society. Um, it's also uh, it's this this pressure to assimilate and 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 give up uh, certain aspects of your culture against your will um, in favor of 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 a success. And so, uh, when when looking at at characters who embody these things, it's like, well, I want to make sure I'm not 
writing them as, as these villains, these scheming villains. Yeah. No, it's I think it's people who grew up in a certain system, whatever that may be, you know, it could be the influence of white nationalism. It could be the influence of simply the entrepreneurial uh, kind of culture or for a USCIS officer. It could even just be as simple as like, well, this is a nine to five job. Not everybody loves their job every single day of their life. So they're going to have bad days. Um, however, with the caveat that the, these kind of jobs do make big ripple effects. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of emotions, a lot of perspective. And and uh, but but I do feel that's the most honest type of filmmaking when 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 I do am able to bring a lot of the that lived experience into these into these uh, into these stories and people in general relate even though they they don't they don't live that they're like oh no i can totally relate in some other way or another i think of for example past lives uh which just came out i mean crazy enough because that one that one mirrors my wife's immigration story and ours so well <laughs> but kind of a what if situation uh -huh. um, not to spoil it but but um but even so, there's like a lot of people who are not immigrants, who are not, you know, they didn't have these like love relationships from across borders, um, who were still able to uh, relate to the experience of having like, uh, you know, uh, a relationship in their 30s, you know, versus their 20s kind of thing and such like that. So that is what I look for in my films. It's like, okay, well, how can I make this still palpable for someone who... Um, you know, is not an immigrant, but maybe they are a business owner, or maybe they, they have gone through the process going to like the DMV and being very frustrated. Definitely one of those things that I felt that was very palpable, like you say in your film, was the fact that it didn't, they didn't feel like cartoon characters, which is sometimes you can may find a lot of shorts where characters feel like uh, archetypal, not archetypal, more stereotypical representations of what is reality. Because in your film, the dialogue feels very natural. And I was... You know, I felt as I was watching that bureaucratic clerk officer, you had the frame of mind regarding that character where you just wanted to coldly show what that person would ask as part of her job. And probably there are some inner frustrations that she is not displaying, you know, that's her own personal life, but never did it felt too much. And I think that's in part, of course, the focus of it all, you know, you're directing with your actors. I mean, it all felt very, very uh, natural. I mean, one question that I left at, but not because it was their intention, I imagine. I left at because I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And I, I would like to ask you this, if this happened to you, was the question, uh, did you ever belong to the Communist Party? And I <laughs> immediately stopped the film and started laughing because of, what the heck, this is like 1959 or something? <laughs> yes, you know, that was yes. Still to this day, the um, if if someone has become part of the of the Communist Party, is grounds for inadmissibility into wow. the US. And so that wow. is very, yeah. it, there, it, that question is in the in the it the, is actually in the form the okay. I four eighty five yeah which is the green card and then the N for the N uh, four hundred which is the, the 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 citizenship one it's on both of those there's a list of questions that have that you uh -huh. know, ever been a member between like nineteen thirty something and nineteen like forty Five, were you ever a member of the Nazi party? You know, like, <laughs> like, were you like were a member of Al Qaeda? Oh, uh, right. Member of uh, yeah, it's all these, all these, all these um, questions. And if you do click yes, it's not necessarily automatic. Like you don't get it. You're mm -hmm. supposed to write a statement about that. I remember I was I was 18 when I filled out my citizenship form, and I was like looking at that list, and I'm like, what happens if someone has to check? Like yeah, multiple, yes. do they write a book? <laughs> do they write a book? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was in Al Qaeda, and then I went to the Communist Party. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I came yeah. out of that. <laughs> the classic. I mean, just, yeah. I, I just, just says it. yes to everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, when they repeat some of the questions to verify in the in the interview, um, they they ask some of those questions. I just I just think it's funny. It's like oh, yeah, that's funny. It's like let, let's make sure make sure that they don't see. You know, I've got books of Leon Trotsky and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, going on to the next question after this, um, we also noticed that the film uh, Oscar Jimenez, our cinematographer, chose to shoot it on super 16 millimeter. If we are correct, and uh, what was behind that choice? And if you had to give any tip, good tips about mm -hmm. shooting on film for someone, anyone who wants to prepare for that challenge, what would you give? <laughs> Well, the answer to that, I think, is going to be very interesting because tackling 
those are specific. We love it when people ask us like, oh, we love it that you shot on film. We actually <laughs> didn't shoot it on film. We <laughs> right. uh, shot on digital, oh. we shot on Alexa, on, on Alexa Mini. And then our colored edited film we sent to a lab uh, in New York called Metropolis Post. And they do a process called uh, digital to film, film to digital out. Yeah. So they shot it through Super 16 uh, film. Oh my God. And okay. so it had all the elements of that and we we, we brought it back. Um, so you just revolutionized the whole thing. You are aware of that. <laughs> it changes, yeah. yeah, it changes everything. It's, um, yeah, no, we've had lots of people be like, oh, we love that you shot it on film. And we're just like, he, he, you know. <laughs> like, just like, look at them and say, that. yeah, we did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, I think I think one one keen eye a person was like I'm very confused because it has like the depth of field of a of a super 35 but it's like the elements grain of a of a super 16 how did you do that and I'm like oh <laughs> this is how we did it. Yeah. Um, uh, so there was there was a couple of reasons why we did that. Um first one is we actually had budgeted in to shoot in on film but we quickly realized that being in Utah, there's not any Super 16 equipment out here. So mm -hmm. what actually put us over budget for that was the cost of having extra days of rental so that we could ship uh, the equipment from LA or somewhere else. And that, and that just put us over budget. So we're just like, oh, I guess we won't be able to do it. So we shot it on on, on digital, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we were able to do so, but then uh, we just had some money left over just simply because we had budgeted like the cost of getting the film and everything. And that was enough to cover that, that out to film process we were looking at. I mean, obviously the, the recent films that had done that, you know, the uh, Brendan uh, Fraser, uh, Greg, Greg, Greg Fraser had been doing that with the Batman and Dune and such, but right. on a bigger, on a bigger uh, format, you know, he was shooting um, LF, he was shooting on the LX LF and then, and then the doing on Super 35. So we thought it's like, oh, well, let's do this. We had also seen a, a, a dance short film that had done it. I can't remember. I think it was called Home. And Metropolis Post had posted it on their, on their site. Uh, Oscar knew the director. And so he had a link to it. And we were looking at it. We were like, this looks really good. And uh, to to mirror as well what, what, uh, what Fraser has said on his process, it, it's like it's not... It's not a it's not a hundred percent substitution. What it does, it creates a, a, a real hybrid look, um, because the biggest thing, obviously, aside from you know the the physical elements of the film, the 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 the, the grain and, and the dust and, and things like that, um, you also have there's a softening of of everything. It softens up your edges. It softens up um, the the highlights. Just get treated a little bit dif differently as well. And so depending on how much you want to bring in, so what's nice is that when Metropolis gives you back the, the scan, they give you a, uh, a pretty big uh, file so you can still manipulate it uh, how you want. Um, and you can bring out as much as, as you want. You can like really saturate it or you can uh, bring it back down. Um, and so he, Oscar and I did find out it's like, oh, if we're going to do this again, we should probably expose like we are doing for film because uh if you do crunch it really like the, the 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 shadows will get lost a lot in that um and so it's like you know if you expose for for film you know you're exposing for those shadows and such then you can actually um crunch it a lot more you can you can really pull it push it a lot more than than, than you would have um so if anyone is actually thinking of doing that that is that is a tip we would recommend um <laughs> But no, but we, we were really happy. We were scared at first because we didn't know what it was going to look like. Um, and then we got it back and we we're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, cool. it looks great. Looks I great. remember a couple of days ago, uh, no, a couple of months ago, I was just going through files in my computer and and I and the and the and the older version without without any of the film elements on there um came up. And I was like, oh, let me, let me, let me look at it. And it just looks, it looks fake. <laughs> it's not, it's not, does not look, look real. It looks like somebody just like painted over with like, you know, digital like sharpening or, or something like that. It was, it was very strange after months and months of seeing this film already with, with its elements on there. Yeah.
so as you've mentioned, living in Utah, you you live quite close or relatively close to the Sundance Film Festival, where your film was, obviously. Um, and so what was that like, the experience at the festival, what activities, like also the feedback you heard from your film? And uh, on another note also, is there any like, do you feel like there's any type of strategy that you have to have to submit a film to a big festival like this? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll tackle this in different different parts. I think something unique about filmmakers here living in Utah is that proximity um, where we can we can go to the festival, we can be there almost any year that we want to just be able to watch films, try to get into the parties and try to network. Mm -hmm. um, but to actually go as a director and with having like a film in, it's obviously a completely different experience um you know it's 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 strange you know you're walking around and the director's badges are colored differently than than the other badges so they stick out you know it's like a bright orange color um and so people know oh, that's a director that's that kind of thing um and and obviously it's when, when you go to a festival you it's it's a lot easier saying it's like oh yeah i'm here i'm here because i have a film and so it it raises more questions where people be like, oh, what's it about? Like, you know, it mm -hmm. it, it kind of helps breaking the a conversation ice. starter. Right? Exactly, because right. a lot of us filmmakers tend to be very introverted, <laughs> <laughs> and so really hard to kind of start these conversations in a natural way. Um, but when you know, when you when you start the conversation, I'm a filmmaker. I have a filmmaker here. Then it's a lot easier to to ease into that conversation. Um, but going back to like uh, the Utah thing, I mean, I feel like every 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 filmmaker um, has at one point tried to make a, a short or a project and, and send it off to Sundance in hopes that it's going to get there. Obviously, more so here in Utah. There is, I mean, every, I mean, as a student, ever since I was like a student, my first year um, of college and, you know, up until now, everybody, every project that I've been on has tried to like submit uh, their project to, to, to Sundance and such. And so there is this strange relationship where I, I think there's frustration of filmmakers here that it's like oh it's so close yet so close so far away <laughs> um because and and that's not just you know the fault of it's just just so many people I think the numbers this year for shorts uh it was like eleven thousand shorts that were like submitted and only 67 were were oh. and someone was saying it's like yeah those those odds are like are even worse than trying to get into Harvard and, you know, and, and <laughs> so <laughs> that yeah. it's, 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 it's an intense competition. And I think, I think for something to be so close yet so far away, I think creates a, it creates an interesting uh, situation because obviously there's, there's, there's filmmakers here who kind of are, are in, in, in that world, you know, they've either been alumni or know people who are alumni and, you know, they, they, they love Sundance, you know, and then there's always the filmmakers who are just so bitter about Sundance. <laughs> like, oh, they didn't take my project, but they took some other project and it was worse than mine and kind of, and it's like, well, I mean, with those numbers, it's like, it's true. I think, I think the Sundance curation team is, they're very, I mean, they're all wonderful people. I mean, just all the all the programmers that I met and everything, they're just amazing. And you know, you would think that these these are some these are some of the biggest uh, gatekeepers of the industry, in, in a way, you know, and they don't act like they're like the gatekeepers. They're just they 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 literally are people who, when they see a project and say like, "I want to support this filmmaker," that's what they go into. They look at projects and say like, "Which filmmakers do I want to help?" you know, their, their career, they, they see potential in that. And, and, and that's one of the things I think they go into when looking at, at, at projects. It's like, you know, where, how is Sundance going to help this, this filmmaker flourish? And granted, I mean, there is, I think, I don't think all, all films, you know, naturally would get into Sundance, but, but it also has a lot of variety. You know, I, I think, um, Obviously, with like between the midnight and the and the regular kind of like especially shorts, because uh, it seems to be the entry level. There's kind of a very very wide arrangement of the types of films you're gonna watch. But I did notice it's like oh yeah, there's not that many films that are just straight up like sci-fi or straight up like horror films. 
you know, that I go to it. It's typically if there is a somewhat of a sci-fi or a horror film that is a short, it's usually layered in with like another kind of genre, like a more dramatic or comedy mm -hmm. kind of aspect and such. So I I mean strategy wise for for um for getting into festivals, this is I think this is the same thing with any festival is if you're a filmmaker that hasn't gone to any festivals yet or with a film, it's it's like I would I would recommend that you go to the festivals you're interested in in ever like going in there and just start connecting. Try to connect with the with the programmers, try try to connect with like ask them questions. And I think I'm sure they're like they're they're able to they're happy to just like answer. Uh, even emailing them, you know, if, if if you know a friend that's gotten in or 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 has like you know, a way to contacting them. It's it's just good to be like, hey, could I could I try to get in contact with someone? And just just ask to just just ask them questions, because what what that does it's it, one it lets you in kind of a little bit more of like their headspace, like what they're looking for, what they're doing, and two it it starts a somewhat of a relationship. Now, granted, that doesn't always guarantee like getting in. I know people who have been involved with the Sundance Institute for years and for many different, you know, whether they be, they were like uh, volunteers at like the festival or they were PAs at the Sundance labs and, and they know personally um, the programmers there and everything. It's like, who also have gotten, have not gotten in into the festival. Um, that's also very, very true. Could also very happen. But it's good to have those relationships. A lot of times what does happen is these programmers have a lot of other festivals that they program as well. Even getting into those or or becoming part of that that circuit, that 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 close community, um, it just it just gives you a platform in order to be able to like, well, maybe my, this film this year didn't get in. But I can also aspire for the next one. Also, just going to festivals will kind of let you know what kind of films get in there. Because sometimes you have a film that just does not fit in for um, for a specific festival, but it might for another one. And it might help you rethink. I think one of the things that helped me as a student was that I went to a festival down in St. George, Utah, um, that tries to program a lot of films from Tribeca, from Sundance, from TIFF. And it let me see like, oh, those are the kinds of films that like get into these like festivals. So it, it helped me aspire not, not only to like, oh, these are the kind of themes or, or topics or it's just it, about the filmmaking itself, like the kind of filmmaking that is groundbreaking, the kind of filmmaking that is groundbreaking, not only technically, but also narratively. That's what helped me a lot in, in a way to not necessarily like I'm crafting this as a Sundance film, but it did help me at least make a kind of a, a decision on where to apply it. Maybe. Exactly. Yeah. And inspiration of like, I like those narratives and I like that style. I want to do that for myself. Yeah. And what would you say? There's the curious thing that you said, some programmers at Sundance may deal with other festivals. Do you yeah. know in talks with programmers, what other festivals? Do totally. They, uh, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I know, for example, um, uh, there's kind of just speaking well there, there's kind of a mixture of a little bit for example Sudeep um, Shar Sharma I think is his last name he programs features at Sundance but he's also the lead programmer at Palm Springs Shorts Film okay. Festival right, right. and a lot of times he is kind of the um, he's uh, I, he used to work a lot with Aspen as well um, and I mean even he was like a guest like an ind industry guest at Aspen this year. If some it's it's easier, you know, it's like Aspen, I think, programmed 299 films this year. So it's a lot easier. And you like you get into that film and you can probably meet Sadiq. And at Palm Springs, for example, uh Landon Zackheim, who is a shorts programmer at Sundance, was there, you know, being part of the industry. Uh the South by Southwest filmmakers were there as well. I mean the the South by Southwest um Programmers were there as well, you know, uh, the, uh, Francis Roman and, and and all them. So, the I mean, I would say the the big the big shorts filmmaking. Well, I would say Palm Springs specifically as a shorts film festival will bringing the shorts film short film people in like a nice place to 
uh, to connect. Um, and so I would say it's definitely worth going to that if you want to like kind of get into those. Another few festivals, Sonoma Film Festival is ran by Amanda Salazar. Amanda Salazar, she programs, um, well, no, she's, she runs the Sonoma International Film Festival in, in around in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, she, she's a, she's a programmer at, at shorts at Sundance, but also has this other festival The I feel I, every once in a while, some of the Sundance, uh, programmers also program like Denver film festival. Um, there's a, there's a programmer that I've gotten really acquainted with online. <laughs> I haven't actually met him, but he's programmed me in like five, six festivals already. Um, but he like programs like Santa Barbara, Milwaukee, um, even like the Cine Las Americas, which is the Austin Latino Film Festival, um, right now Loft Film Festival. Like there's like there like he he programs all of them, and he's like friends with like the Sundance programmers as well. Like so, the there there are certain pockets of of uh, of like programmers, but I think being in the in the in the in the circuit long enough, you start picking up on like who knows who and 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 such. Um. So I would I would I would recommend that sometimes too I I would recommend for example Loft Film Festival it's kind of like a smaller curated film festival that you know you you don't really hear about but like Mike Plant you know like helps support that which you know, he's like the lead programmer at Sundance and 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 this other programmer that I talked about I uh, blank on his name right now but he like programs all these other film festivals that I've been to I think also kind of knowing what some of those are I, I what i would recommend is is doing this like when you go to film freeway and there's ever like like information listed down there not necessarily for the big festivals i know for the big festivals they don't really do this but for like the smaller ones that you kind of hear on filmmakers recommend to you like a film festival look at the page on film freeway and sometimes they'll have the like the programmer information there just click on them like look at look through them like google them and you'll probably find that they program like maybe some of the other fil film festivals that you that you are uh, interested in going. I, I think the last thing that I will say is that some of these like smaller boutique film festivals um, are great places to build community. And so while they might not have as crazy of, uh, of, of industry presence there like Sundance or, or Tribeca, um, you will get to connect a lot more intimately with with other filmmakers. And, and I think sometimes you, 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 you kind of choose certain festivals over the other, um, based on different situations. I always recommend that at the first, because, um, you never know. I just went to a, a, a festival down in LA called salute your shorts film festival. You know, the programmers all there are also filmmakers and it's a smaller festival, but they, because it is a smaller festival and they are well-connected, they were able to get uh, Daniel Scheinert and his VFX team to go and give a, a panel presentation for like a small group. Um, they were able to, um, we were able to bring like a couple of other like indie filmmakers that I've known uh, who were there. I, I was, at first I thought I was not gonna know anyone there, but it's like, oh no, it turns out like a lot of people do know each other. I was able to meet a couple of producers and execs there as well, who were just, you know, supporting some films that they had there. And then one of the programmers there, she, because she's a filmmaker and she had her short this year premiere at Slamdance uh, because they know her, she's a, as a, as a, as a, as a programmer there, she's also now programming Slamdance. And so I'm like, oh, now I know a programmer at Slamdance, you know, yeah. it's, it's uh, you never know. Like sometimes, I mean, sometimes it's like duds. I, I would not submit to a festival that you have never heard anything about, but I would definitely submit to festivals that people recommend personally. Yeah, I see our connection there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's a new one. I never had that kind of interaction with uh, Film Freeway in respects to looking at the programs. What are the links to other festivals? But I think that's very good advice. Um, I was just going to ask you about El Monio. I mean, regarding that short, uh, just going to introduce the audience here, our listeners, to the synopsis, you know. So it's about, it concerns this little girl, Andrea, when she finds out about this generational family magic that allows her to find lost things, lost objects, sometimes doesn't really unravel, you know, good things. Uh, clearly shares some of the eeriness from uh, I Have No Tears, but far less political, more of a, a fable of the kind of uh, careful what you wish for morale. And surprisingly, 
uh, very humorous in the sense that I think in the way you showed the magic reminded me of the that kind of endearing quality of the George Melier magic from the earlier cinema somehow. And so, and at the end of the film, you do dedicate it to two people. And this made me wonder if they were at the origin of your will to explore this story. Uh, what was at the origin of the idea? And did the idea came from just Mexican folklore in general, or is this something within your family? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the the two people that they're that it's dedicated to is my two little nephews, um, who are just you know they're they're children. I uh, I wanted to make something. Well, so this was an idea. My so my my wife Lisa Arias, she was our, our co writer and co director, very much a co co creator with me. I'm I'm excited to do more things with her in the future because she's she's very she's a journalist uh, by trade and and has kind of found filmmaking to be a, a really nice way to bring that especially i mean being a journalist in mexico and then coming to the u.s and be like oh what do i write about it's like you know it's like <laughs> yeah maybe write some cinema you know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or, or do documentary um she so this is something that runs in her own family it's like a tradition that they have, especially it's very much like how you, know, you see in the movie you know the you grab the rag you know tie it into a knot and wish for something to that you've lost to come back and I thought, well, I've always loved the genre of of magical realism. Oh yes, and I think it's something that is very prevalent in Latin America. You know, you have uh, yeah. well, I uh, think hundred years of solitude and whatnot. You know, exactly. Yeah, Guillermo del Toro was he he um in an interview that he had he he was doing like a panel, and he he very much like described it really well. He's like in Latin America, you know, you're just you're eating at the dinner table. And all of a sudden, someone will say like, oh, by the way, I just I was visited by our dead grandmother, you know, like last night or something like that. And everyone's like, oh, cool. Yeah, sweet. Yeah. Pass me the salsa. You know, <laughs> it's uh, yeah. that, 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 that kind of relationship of, you know, I'm not I'm not necessarily I'm I'm, I'm skeptic, but I'm not like completely I'm not a completely like unfazed by it. Secular. Yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, I, I understand, like, when people have weird, just strange experiences, there could be a plethora of, of, of explanations for that. But when they say it's like, I lived through this, you're like, yeah, who am I to tell you that you didn't? You know, mm -hmm. even if it was in your head, you lived through it. You know, it's it's um, and I think that's just magical. You know, it's magical realism. I think it's the it's when you embrace the strangeness of life. And are able to use it as a metaphor, you know, for what is going on through you. I mean, for El Moño, it was about kind of being able to reclaim your roots as an immigrant, you know, the, despite the fact that you are in a different country, you know, it's it's about connecting to the generations that were before you. And I mean, that movie in itself, we totally very different. I mean, it's it's very we we didn't think about it as a like a, oh this is a family friendly children's media uh we just thought more about it like a as a oh let's tell it from the point of view of the little girl which is a very innocent very kind of magical point of view and when we did it we and we started like we showed it to like our nephews and some of the kids i mean obviously the the child actor who who we had um andrea and she and and the response was we we weren't just expecting they were so excited you know the moment that they see all these magical things they're like what how is that happening <laughs> and that's when my wife and I were like oh you know what we should definitely start like submitting this to like more like the children like family kind of yeah. based things and now that's actually where it's gone like done really really well for example at San Francisco it played at the family friendly uh, section right now it's the last festival it's going to be playing at it's actually at um what's it called it's uh mill valley that's going to be playing at mill valley it seems like people in san francisco really loved it because it's played like three four festivals there already like in the bay oh wow so amazing um and so, also new york i think new york children's new york festival. new york children's yeah, yeah right now it's doing i think it's doing um there's like a like a a traveling um yeah, they're, they're doing like a travel screenings and such okay. like that I haven't checked where, but I'm sure on their website they say where it's like screening. And then also, I think Me Too TV um, is it's like it just got onto their like streaming platform, and it just it just speaks in a very interesting way. I think I think a lot of people resonated with it in in ways that we did not think it was going to to do so. Um, but 
I mean, that one, if, if we talk about scrappy filmmaking, that is like some of the scrappiest filmmaking that that I've done. I think, you know, we my my wife and I were like, well, we need some money. Obviously, you know, we got to feed the crew and everything. <laughs> um, we raised we we sold tortillas like and and and, and the, you know, we, we made tortillas yeah. on home and like sold them in order to raise some funds, which was inspiration right now for my next uh, for the for the for the feature film that we're doing. It's the idea of like, oh, immigrants making something with their hands and so right. to like um, to survive. That's something that's going in that I have no tears feature film. Um, but anyways, going back. And yeah, I mean, we had a very small budget. We probably the, the most we spent on was probably that um, the ice cream truck that would come in front of our house every day. We flagged it down, chased it down. We were like, hey, <laughs> you, know, like, you want to be in a movie? <laughs> so, yeah, well, and then wait I, a second for the shot. <laughs> Stay there, exactly, motherfucker. <laughs> exactly. We yeah. need to. Yeah. No, everything, everything that was like with that movie was just so exciting. It, it I mean, this was during the pandemic as well. I think for people to just come, it was a small crew, obviously. You know, we, you know, it was, you know, people whoever wanted to donate their talents to it just because we wanted to make a movie. It was bringing them together and, and, you know, the, the exciting, exciting shots like out in the street. You know, we, we had like, we just put like the camera, like our DP was sitting with the camera in the trunk, you know, and we would just like drive with that and nothing fancy. <laughs> Um, are we, you know, trying to time this, the shot where she opens the door and the, and the, and the truck, you know, like, uh, drives by, we had to do that 12 times just to get the timing right and such, but it was fun. It was a very exciting, a very, a very exciting project to work on. So next, next thing that she and her want us want to do, we, we want to do something and again with like with her, with that little girl, you know, she's been on a few other shorts around here locally since then that was her first project so yeah and then we, we 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 introduced her into this world be like <laughs> great. you mentioned working with liz de liz de arias your wife mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to ask then like uh, you've directed solo and you've directed with her is there you feel like there's a difference or a big difference or a significant difference in the process of collaboration as opposed to working solo yes i think so i it's refreshing um and and it's something that I, I like doing. I like doing both, because uh, there's projects that I think it's like okay, the sensi sensitivities here are not necessarily like uh, like my 100%. And so it's things that it's like I know she would do, especially when it's like ideas that come from her. I mean, with Almonio, I, I told her originally it's like we should make a short about this, and and she got really excited, and so we started coming up with the story together. And that that's kind of similar the same way with other uh, short script ideas that we've been drafting and everything that we, I, you know, we're like, hey, we should make a short about this. And, and I'm like, yeah, we should. You should write it. <laughs> you know, you should write it. But, it. but it's things that when she asks me, hey, do you want to help me with this? And it's like, OK, well, let me see what I can bring to it. Um, I know it's always complimentary and it is a bit more difficult sometimes because visions are, you know, when there's like a differing when I'm thinking about it just without talking about it, like my, like a vision and she's talking about her vision, it obviously could be very different at start. And so it's just the communication to be able to get in the same page. Um, it's probably a little bit more lengthier than just like, you know, the kind of uh, topics that I would do, which is with myself, but I think subject matter as well, me, myself, and I, I think the, the projects that I myself like to do by myself tend to be a lot not sadder, but a lot more serious. You know, I think I <laughs> the, there there is something about sadness in film and and and, and and art that that is very interesting to me. And so I, I I mean, a lot of my own personal projects are very much that way. When it's with someone else, I think I think I'm, I'm I, I allow myself to explore different kind of emotions with with that. And so there there definitely is a, a difference. I mean, I feel like. If this is like an ongoing process relationship of how I have like my own projects and the other projects um, with somebody else or, you know, with Lisa specifically, um, I feel like that would maybe would be the distinction. You know, it's like, it's like, oh, yeah, whenever it's him, like we know we're going to be like sad <laughs> or, or so that, you know, when it's with them, it's like, oh, it's going to be something you know, cute and exciting. You know, it's it's a. Uh, if, you know, who knows if that if that happens like that. But, you know, I, I, right now, from what I can tell, it's very much that way. Well, clearly we've seen there your background has a camera assistant and a director. Um, 
you can in a way have already responded to this because the question would be what projects are you working at the moment if you mm. like to continue as a director clearly here we're developing this short i have no tears into a feature mm. can you tease anything more core about it uh that yeah. you would like or any other features perhaps uh, we don't know if you're writing more than one oh i mean there's <laughs> there's a lot there's a list of things <laughs> so i i originally i wanted to do a horror film this earlier this year um and we just didn't get the funds for it. It wasn't going to be like a terribly difficult, but I wanted to do some practical effects. Um, and horror, I would say horror with, with um, quote, a, unquote. quote unquote, yeah, it was called going to be called Angel Meat. It was about a guy who sees a mysterious object in the sky, shoots it down and it ends up being this weird meat thing. And he's kind of a loner kind of guy. Um, anyways, we were thinking of shooting that earlier this this uh, this month, but uh, we just didn't get the funding for the practical effect. It would have cost a while of money, so still looking for money for that. But it's but that that's still going to happen. I still really want to do that. Right now, there's a few there's two short scripts that I wrote that I kind of going back to grassroots filmmaking. It's like I know I can make this on very very scrappy budgets, you know, because. Um, uh, for example, something with my wife and then something that I want to do by myself as well. Because right now the main focus is the feature for I Have No Tears. Um, just trying to get that developed, trying to get that, uh, you know, finding a producer would be interesting. So I've just been sending it out to producers that I've met along this this year and, you know, seeing who is actually interested in it and and working in it. Um, that one, so the, the premise of that is uh, very much so an immigration story. Um, it's... Uh, a young couple as well. Maria Luisa is the is the main character as well. Jorge plays a definitely a, quite a bigger role. She, um, before you are allowed any kind of like legal, or, or I guess when you're in the limbo, the immigration limbo of like you submitted your green card papers and you're waiting for you know anything to be approved, you technically don't have month. You're you're here legally. You're, you're you're allowed to stay here in the U.S., but you can't really do much. You don't have work permit. You don't have like travel. You're kind of stuck. So a lot of immigrants find just they they look for ingenuity and in ways so they can one make money to um you know try to have a life here and so in in the interim and so so jorge and maria luisa start like a business selling bread because she's like a really good uh baker and they start like selling her bread and such like that and but it quickly devolves into this more uh business thriller about her kind of wanting to get screwed by an investor that they that they that they had who was like their brother-in-law um, and and her trying to take control back of what is essentially her her business her her bread um, aspect, but also losing aspects of herself. I I really like exploring that side of immigration, where you know how much an immigrant is willing to let go of their former self, their their culture, in order to be successful here in the U.S. Um, which again, I say it's a very hyper capitalistic society. So it's it's also very much a critique of that, you know. And I think today we live in a in an interesting time period here in the U.S. where it's you know either you become a millionaire or you are nothing, you know. So which is which is absolutely nuts and crazy because I tell them it's like, well, the odds are of becoming a millionaire is nothing. No. But everybody has that aspiration here. I think it's a it's a very interesting. It's a very interesting it's American uh, dream. Attitude. American dream. Yeah. Put the sunglasses, put the cigar. I'm a millionaire. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's exactly. good attitude. Exactly. But yeah. um, yeah, I, I, I somebody said it's like, yeah, a lot of Americans, the average American feels like a repressed millionaire. And it's like, <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Never they are born that. that way and then they unrepress and, themselves. Yeah, yeah, they they're, they're repressed. It's like, oh no, I really uh, and they die repressed most of the time. <laughs> How long can you stay in limbo, actually? That's a good question. Oh, it depends. I think so recently because of the pandemic, I think they've cut back on a lot of the process. For us, actually, what I think it was about a year and a half that it was that it was like the limbo. So it could be like a long time. So uh, a lot of people do, which is what we did, is that you just apply for a work permit. You, you're allowed to while you're waiting for that. And it comes somewhere in in between the time that that you are that you are here, right? Um, you submit your papers and then get your green card, and so that always helps. For some other people, it could be longer. Nowadays, what I've heard has actually been happening. They'll submit it, and the process will be relatively quicker. I mean, a year will pass by, but they won't have like a like an interview 
like we, we on our on our on our end because it was a marriage based green card they do a they do something called like conditions where you're only you only have a green card for two years and then after two years you have to renew it just to make sure that it's like this this is a real relationship kind of thing <laughs> and, yeah. and essentially and then, in, in putting these conditions so you have to have even more exactly, work exactly so you have to apply yeah. to remove the conditions and and yeah. such but for example i had a friend who's kind of in the same situation and and they didn't go through like an interview um and and when they got their green card they just didn't have any conditions on it so it was no. you know so right now right now immigration is kind of tricky we also when we all did all this process it was during the trump era and and it was just very very strict i, I know there were like some very strict um even policies that wanted to be voted on that were just like oh wow that's going to even be harder to do us to do so right now i think because of the pandemic it slowed a lot of things down so they're just trying to process as many things as possible a lot of things have been changing and then as well it's just a different administration so that always that always factors into it so who knows i mean there's there's people who at some point in their life also tried doing that and they waited for like two three years um you know we know people who they uh, they submitted when I was a kid, you know, when I did everything, everything was so fast that, you know, it doesn't even compare to what it was like now. So it just really, really depends. So regarding I have no tears, but not just not just that one, uh, your other work, uh, are you expecting it to go to any online pa platforms? And do you have any plans towards that? Or are you still still thinking more in the festival circuit? I think there's only one more festival that we're looking for i think um it's going to be the one the one that we're the last one that we're expecting for is clermont ferrand which is in oh cool in yeah, january yeah. i think january i think so yeah. if we get into that great that's its last one if not i mean i think morelia which is we're we're we're, we're screening in morelia film festival in in, a, in next month that one might be its last regardless i think online I mean, I've been talking with like Vimeo, so like staff picks, it'll probably be around there when like around January, January, February. Um, so it'll probably just be online unless someone wants to pick it up for for some sort of like uh, streaming distribution as well, which, you know, might be, uh, I think anything at this point, it's like, oh, it might be just be on like a, any kind of small thing or just Vimeo, like a, like a staff mm -hmm. pick, it'll Probably mm -hmm. February, I think it's probably when it'll be just be out there for the world. It's it's had a good good run, you know, since since January this year. So, yeah, definitely. Actually, one question I went to earlier was the question of funding and researching funding. Uh, I guess this would truly be the final question. But when you, what's what's the process for you? Do you, is your head after writing after developing that first uh, kind of initial intimate process with the film? Do you go straight to a producer? Do we discuss with him uh, how to research the fund? Do we rely on crowdfunding? Uh, some of the filmmakers to explore more their savings, although that's dangerous. Yeah, I know they say don't don't use your own money to make a film. Yeah, I think sometimes you have to. Uh, my friend Selma Cervantes, who did Sweat Shop Girl uh, with with Yalitza Paricio, that played at, at Sundance this year as well. Um, I know she had to like do use a lot of her money, you know, to, to be able to do it just because, you know, I, I think, I think there isn't, there is an aspect of like, how much are you willing to invest in yourself, you know, with that regard? Um, cause sometimes, you know, you just don't have the network to ask people like, oh, are you willing to put $10,000 down? And with that, I would also say, um, also write what you can shoot. I, I think that's always like a, a, you know, if I know that like, oh, I can probably use my house or like, or a, or, or a basement or a friend's house who's like, oh yeah, totally ever come shoot a film here, you know, or, or you know that you have like actor friends who would be, just be willing to like get on a project with you. Like, I think use that to your advantage, at least for now. We did do a crowdfund for I Have No Tears, um, uh, you know, principally just so we could get like money to to do film, you know, which didn't end up do so. But with the money that we were able to save on that, we were able to, for example, get Alejandra, you know, which came from Mexico. We were able to pay for her flight and have her stay here for, you know, for a few days and such like that, that we probably wouldn't have been able to had we not thought about like crowdfunding and 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 grants. So I would always say, well, I would also say with crowdfunding, I think you only get one shot at it because we tried doing with that with Angel Meat and I was like kind of expecting like, 
oh, I don't think I'll be able to raise this much money because most of the people that donated to I Have No Tears did not donate. It is true. You know, in terms of the pool of friends and family, exactly. <laughs> it starts exactly. retracting. <laughs> as exactly. for the Very much so. Yeah. Very much yeah. so. so I would, and then I you would... depend on having a good publicity, really, with the crowdfunding campaign. Yeah, exactly. always on the clock with Instagram stories or that kind of stuff. It's uh, exhausting. It's, it's exhausting. It's, yeah, it's kind of a second job in a way. Yeah. No, definitely. I thought I I do always think when I'm writing a, a short, I think like, okay, how can I shoot this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I'm writing it for me, you know. If yeah. I'm writing it for something other else, just to have a spec, I can go crazy. It's like, oh yeah. If I ever want like aliens or something like that, I can totally do that. But, <laughs> but no, I do think about like what I can do with me right now. If someone were to say like, okay, you've got no money. What can you make? And, and that's how I think about it. And when there's bud once there's budget starting to like attach either by um, personal funds or by, by um, uh, just grants, you know, I think grants are a great place to, to try to apply, especially in the U S uh, because there's not a lot, not not that many of them, but they're like, you know, you can find you can find some. I know in in other places, um, I don't I don't know who your biggest uh, audience is and where where they're at, but I mean, there's there's obviously just other countries will have different types of grants and everything, you know that that always helps if you think about like a no budget short film kind of thing. Um, obviously, the city matters. I, I mean, obviously. I think shooting in like Los Angeles, you have access to a lot of things, but also because everybody shoots there, it, it might be more expensive you spend on on locations because everybody is going to want to make yeah. money on. It. I um, think in New York you are free to shoot on the street. Yeah, with with uh, with, yeah. with if you're if you're handheld, I think you you can shoot on the street, and you know you get all the. Uh, the production value of New York City. Of New York. Oh. <laughs> I'll have that. I'll have that street. Okay. <laughs> Just shopping exactly. around for locations. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, places like here, Utah, you might you might find there's a lot of listings in our Utah Film Commission, but most of those listings, if you call, be like, hey, can I shoot in your place? They'll be like, yeah, that'll be $2,000. So it might just be easier knocking on a door and be like, can we make a movie here? And they'll be like, yeah, sure, totally, come on in. Yeah, yeah no, that's actually, you know, always a question, you know, in terms of interiors, if you want to shoot at a house, not yours, um, how do you approach people? How do you <laughs> get in there? You know, that's the complication, you know. Sometimes and, and sometimes. Just Angel Meat, we were looking to shoot at a, like a storage unit facility, which we have access to. I mean, we asked them and they're like, totally, yeah, you know, just like a small unit of, of storage places, um, you know, and they don't have their locations listed down on, on a, the film commission on yeah. a film website. So sometimes it is just that, just going around, knocking on doors, find the neighborhood that you think like, okay, I like the look of this neighborhood. Let me see if, if any houses mm -hmm. there. or, or, or if you know somebody who lives around there and they might know either themselves or their neighbors. Sometimes it's it's it is moving outside the box, which can be really hard. You know, as an introverted filmmaker, you're like, I don't want to ask people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you have to. Hey, you know, I've already knocked on doors and asked for a you know a curtain <laughs> from a person yeah. for a short film. It didn't work out, but you know, you put yourself out there and see what happens. <laughs> well, even I swear to God, I'm not here to rob you. Just hear me out. <laughs> hear me yeah. out. I want to make a movie in your house. Well, even when writing characters, I mean, I, one of the challenges for me, I write a lot of uh, Latino based, you know, uh, stories here, which and and the pool, the talent pool for Latino, um, specific Latino uh, talent here is not big. So I need to write roles for the people that I know here are going to be able to fill. Um, mm -hmm. And so this next short film that I wrote is based off of a feature film idea that I have in which the feature film idea revolves around the teenager, but I don't know any like Mexican teenagers here that can play. So I just, but I do know a little girl. So I'll just, for the short film, I'll switch it to like the, to her and, you know, and have like younger parents and such. So yeah, hoping that by the time I get to make a feature of it, maybe I'll have more access to shoot it down in like Texas or something like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Texas has a good, great community. Yeah, and there's there's a lot of Mexican actors that go to Texas as well. Yeah, just mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because it's so close. Yeah. So it's, um, I mean, also I do want to because I'm from Monterrey and grew up in like in in southern Texas as well. Like I, that relationship, I I'm very interested in making movies about that, like the border of North Mexico and 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 southern Texas. It's it's a very 
it's a very unique place because there's a lot of it, it shares a very symbiotic uh relationship the people there and the cities there and that was the latest from Luis Fernando Puente, folks. We would like to thank his presence here today. He is truly an excellent filmmaker. Have a look into his work once out on streaming platforms. If you're a filmmaker running the festival marathon, feel free to send us a message for an interview as well. We would love to promote your work. Don't forget to subscribe, share this interview, or simply give us a like. That's how our podcast can grow ever more groovy. And if you are on YouTube and want to see more interviews like this, check out this next video right here. Thank you for listening and see you next time. Thank you.